Um, this kind of turned into more of like a sort of summary and book report of uh, the first chapter of this, which is uh, Melissa Aguirre Grant's Playing the Whore, The Work of Sex Work, which is a very good book so far. Um, I'm hoping that I will be able to do more of a deeper dive into it some other time, but I wasn't able to get quite into it as much as I had hoped to. Um, it starts off with, um, uh, the first chapter is about policing and the um, how, how that affects like sex work and people's perception of sex work. Um, like it tells the story of like a sting operation happening um, where there's like a crashing appearance of black vests, ball caps, guns drawn on undressed people who are told to bend, kneel, and spread their arms. Um, prostitution stings are a law enforcement tactic used to target men who buy sex and women who sell it, or men and women who the police have profiled in this way. So you don't even have to be a sex worker, you just have to look vaguely like a sex worker. Um, and these things are often recorded and this can lead to many problems. Um, whether these videos are locked in evidence rooms or broadcast on 11 o'clock news or blogged by vigilantes, um, they are a punishment. We could arrest you at any time, they say, even if no one is there to witness your arrest, everyone will know when we record your arrest, when you're being viewed again and again, you will be getting arrested all the time. Um, and it's to this that we need to ask is like, what is there a public good in, in staging these transactions to make arrests? Um, and is the point to produce order to protect people or simply to punish? Um, and basically it comes down to like to produce it is it's it's kind of like a magic trick to produce a prostitute where before there was a woman and is a socially acceptable way um to police and discipline women fueled by a lust for law and order that is the core of what the author calls the prostitute imaginary um the ways in which we conceptualize prostitutes and make arguments about prostitution. The prostitute Im imaginary compels those who seek to control, abolish, or otherwise profit from prostitution is also the rhetorical product of their efforts. It is driven by both fantasies and fears about sex and the value of human life. Um, and the stings are very much intended to incite fear. Um, in West Bengal, uh, the sex worker collective uh, Durbar Mahila Samanwaga Committee surveyed over 21,000 women who do sex work. They collected 48,000 reports of abuse or violence by police, um, in contrast to just 4,000 reports of violence by customers who are thought of as the biggest threat to sex work. Um, especially by company, especially by campaigners who are opposed to prostitution. Um, in China, uh, sex workers that have been arrested get forced, were forced to do um, shame parades in, in public where they are shackled, photographed by police and the police publish these photos on the web. Um, and in 2006, there was a big outrage around this. And for the most part, these public shaming rituals have stopped. But I did actually uh, did a little bit of my own research on this just to sort of understand more of the context behind it. And um, these women were tried, I found an article by The Guardian um, called Outrage at Chinese Prostitutes Shame Parade. Um, Women tried to hide their faces with surgical masks. However, it was not enough to hide their identities as police revealed their names, hometowns, and dates of birth while publicly sentencing them all to 15 days in prison. So all of that just for 15 days of prison. Um, civilians found it to be going too far. 
A university professor said, I think the parade is a violation of human rights. The public humiliation may frighten people, but it is not a good way for resolving problems. And it's not fair. Why are only sex criminals paraded in public? What about people guilty of graft and corruption? And the All China Women's Federation filed a formal protest with the Ministry of Public Security, saying the parade was old fashioned, damaging to social harmony and an insult to all the women in China. Um, and the author goes into, goes on to this um, to explain um, that she had done a, she was invited to do a talk at Yale University um, where she describes the way like the police work with, with sex workers and, um, as she was about to leave, several students came and asked, well, well why haven't you, it, this argument would be more persuasive if you had actually stated your views on prostitution, whether you see it as good or not. And it's like, and she says, do you need to know if I oppose prostitution before you can evaluate how you feel about police abuse, about persistent pattern of denying justice to people labeled as prostitutes? Are these videos to be understood only as documents of an acceptable form of violence to be applied as a deterrent to, to deliberately make prostitution less safe? Um, the students taught the author to see how narrowly and insistently people can focus their opposition to what they understand as the system of, of prostitution. So much so that even police violence against sex workers is collapsed into that system how this violence appears inevitable. The stigma and violence faced by sex workers are far greater harms than sex work itself, yet it is illegible to those who see prostitution as a self-enforcing system of violence. For them, prostitution marks out the far reach of what's acceptable for women, men and where rights end and violence is justice. This is an accepted, this is accepted as the cost of protecting those most deserving of protection. Opponents of sex work decry prostitution as a violent institution, yet concede that violence is also, also useful to keep people from it. Um, and then she goes into uh, this concept known as the carceral eye. So like if, if this is what we see prostitution is, then what actually is the crime happening here and it is very much just like in legis in legislation it is not even like the sex acts itself that is the um crime that's happening it is specifically the solicitation it is it is as soon as like money is being transferred over then it is considered a crime um and in some places as i had stated earlier um, you don't even have to be a prostitute or sex worker to be sus sus like to be seen as suspicious by police. Um, in in uh, Washington, um, there is there is a law where you can't you can't really congregate in groups or two or more people just on the street if if the chief of police has designated this zone a prostitution free zone um and this this especially affects transgender women where um they support that in significant numbers they cannot even walk freely in their own neighborhoods from their apartments to the train without being followed by police accusing them of working whether they are or not um Sex workers and anyone perceived to be a sex worker are believed to be always be working or in the cop's view, always committing a crime. People who are profiled by cops as sex workers include trans women, women of color, queer and gender non-conforming youth. This isn't as much about policing sex. It's about profiling and policing people whose sexuality and gender are considered suspect. Um, then there's also like the weird thing around like feminists and everything who seem to take like this whole view of like, well, actually it's good to be policing sex work. Um, appeals for stepped up vice enforcement come not just from command, but from feminist corners too. Um, there's been a recent, it's not really recent anymore, but recent as, a, as of uh, 
2013 in this book, um, that even, even mainstream women's rights organization, uh, rather than arrest what they call prostituted women, they would rather you go after the Johns or the demand. Um, and it's it's strange because like you're still you're still on the same side as the people who commit the most violence against sex workers, which is the police. And um, this comes to the story of uh, District Attorney Kathleen Rice celebrating the arrests of 106 men for allegedly buying sex in a single month and leaving out of her press conference the arrests in that same month of 23 women for selling sex. Um, and she had like a big blown up poster board of like all of these Johns, um, including some doctors and um, including some doctors, um, a few lawyers and some dentists. <laughs> and it's just, yeah, um, I, I went on a bit of a, a deep dive into this as well. Um, it's, and the New York Daily says in 2013, Rice defends punishing these men for the words they, they allegedly said to fake prostitutes by arguing that she is thereby protecting real prostitutes from risk. Sex workers are often vulnerable victims of traffickers and pimps, she said in a press release. Um, many of the headlines about this sting operation that she um, headed were quite, um, were quite negative. Um, how she actually did it was that she just hosted a ton of fake advertisements on personal sites to lure in um, men. And her belief was that um, these men create the demand. Anyone who uh, patronizes a prostitute creates the problem. Um, I know many people see this as a victimless crime, un crime unworthy of prosecution, that we should arrest the prostitutes and let the Johns slide. I would not strong. I would not more strongly disagree. She says, um, an attorney for one of the men who was an, an attorney for a few of the men who got caught up in this actually is actually considered um, challenging this initiative um, because he had also done like something in the in the past in 2008 where he won a court fight over um, over drunk drivers being listed on a wall of shame website um, where this attorney Brian Griffin says we're reviewing our options we have a system of justice presumes innocent and waits until after conviction before punishing people. This has all the hallmarks of a wall of shame type case to, to humiliate or punish people before they have their right to be heard in court is to undo the very essence of our criminal justice system. Now, I don't fully agree with his um, idea of what the US criminal justice system, how that works, but you, I understand where he's coming from. It's like it's it's pure. This is purely just like a way to name and shame people for what they're doing behind closed doors, rather than actually protecting or serving anyone, as the police can claim to be claim to do. Um, and this is and um, going back to the book. Um, Elizabeth Bernstein describes this as carceral feminism, uh, reliance on law and order and power of the state to bring about gender justice, rather than couching crackdowns on sex work as fighting crime. Now some feminists appeal to the police to pursue stings against the sex trade in the name of gender equality. And I, I really like this book because like she does, the, the author really does seem to have quite a sort of snarky attitude. Um, she says, we can't arrest our way to a feminist utopia. <laughs> but that doesn't, that hasn't stopped influential women's rights organization, organizations from demanding that we try. <laughs> um, and this is how District Attorney Rice is able to claim that she arrests, when she arrests men, she's going after the demand, but when she arrests women, she is only getting them into services and it, that doesn't really make sense because if you're arresting all of these sex workers and saying that you're doing it to help them, you're, you're 
putting them um, in the way of the people who commit the most violence to them in the first place. And um, a lot of these, a lot of these services um, are aren't even that great anyway because they are designed to isolate sex workers. They're like they're rehabilitation centers. Um, they're isolated and the doors are locked, phones are monitored, and guests aren't allowed. Um, there isn't compassion here. It's it's purely an act of control. Um, and we are using the policeman's eye when we can't see a sex worker as anything but his or her work as an object to control. It's not just a carceral eye, it's a sexual eye. If a sex worker is always working, always available, she is essentially sexual. It's um this is why when we demonize the customer's pers perspective on the sex worker as one of absolute control why we situate the real violence sex, sex workers can face as an individual man's responsibility and why we imagine that all sex workers must be powerless to say no we have no way of understanding how to relate to the prostitute we've imagined but through control so like basically what she's arguing is the um the whole thing of like policing sex work really just colors like our whole idea around what sex work is and the um the power the the power um dynamics going on behind this as everyone kind of just like the general like consensus around sex work is that it's a horrible horrible thing that people who are abused go into to get more abused and it's just a horrible time. And I'm not going to lie and say like how some people do that it's like empowering or whatever. It's it's a job, as same as everything else. Um, but the 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 violence um, around this job is very much overstated, and is often the fault of the police trying to trying to crack down and control these the bodies of women. And it is very much like another form of social control of women and of women's sexuality, as well as like um, queer people as well. 